Well, let's take a look here at quantitative methods, basic concepts, our first reading in that study session, the time value of money. So the first LOS here, we need to interpret interest rates. And when we talk about an equilibrium interest rate, we can talk about it as a required rate of return. And given the risk of the investment, there's a particular rate of return adjusted for that risk that investors require to hold that asset, security, investment, whatever. But we also refer to uh, interest rates as discount rates because we can use them to get today's value of money to be received in the future. And we'll use that a bit in corporate finance. We use discount rates a lot, but we do it any time we need to get the present value, the value today of cash flows to be paid in the future. Another way we can look at interest rates is as the opportunity cost of current consumption. Because the decision is really when workers earn money, do I want to spend it today or do I want to invest it and have more money in the future? So it's in that sense that this interest gives you the opportunity cost of consuming now because what you're giving up is that amount in the future based on the interest rate. Now we'll look at the components of interest rates. We think of this as kind of the build-up uh, view of interest rates. And we're going to look at the components of the required nominal interest rate. The nominal interest rate, nominal meaning named, that's just the one that you see. Okay. If we say a treasury bond is yielding 6%, that's a nominal interest rate. So let's look at how we build up to get there. We start with the real risk-free rate. And so there's no inflation in the real rate. The real rate you always want to think of as in terms of stuff, not in terms of dollars or other currency units. Okay, so the real rate says, well, if you wait and consume later, you can get this much more stuff. Now, if we add expected inflation to that, then we get the nominal risk-free rate. And that would be like what we see on a, a treasury bill, short-term, liquid, uh, basically risk-free rate. And so that includes the real rate, how much more stuff you get, but it also includes the amount that the price level is expected to go up. And then if we start adding premiums for risk, we, get it, we can get the... Uh, uh, required rate of return on a risky security or risky investment. And here we've got three of them listed out. The default risk premium, based on the probability that a bond won't make its promised payments. We also have a risk premium for liquidity. Now we think of treasury bills, for example, of being very liquid security. But other securities, if you want to buy and sell them in a short period of time, you may get a price different from the current market price because of a lack of liquidity. And then our last one here is a maturity risk premium. Under normal circumstances, longer-term bonds carry a greater maturity risk premium than shorter-term bonds. Now we've got to talk about stated rates compared to effective rates. Now when we say we have a stated annual rate of 6%, then we need to know well, what's the compounding period. If the compounding is annual, then the effective annual rate is 6%. But what if that 6%, what if we're getting 3% every six months? so that we're earning interest on interest over that second period. Well, with semi-annual compounding and a stated interest rate of 6%, we just divide that by two, two periods a year, and get three, and that's our effective rate for each six-month period. But our effective rate for the annual period, we get compounded interest on interest so we increase whatever we started with by 3% and then increase that amount by 3% for the second part. And so our effective return 
over the year is 6.9%. Now with more frequent compounding, we're going to have a higher effective annual rate. So look at this example for quarterly compounding. With a stated rate of 6%, we divide that by 4 and get an effective quarterly rate of 1.5%. And then we compound that 1.5% for four periods here and get an effective annual return or effective annual yield, same thing, of 6.136%. If we went to monthly compounding, you see, divide by 12, half a percent is the effective monthly rate. Add half a percent to one, compound it for 12 periods minus one, and that gives us our effective annual rate of 6.168%. So the more frequent the compounding, the higher the effective annual rate for a given annual stated rate. So let's look at an example. Compute the effective annual return if the stated annual rate is 12% compounded quarterly. Four quarters in a year, let's divide that stated rate by four and get a 3% effective quarterly rate. So our effective annual return, or effective annual yield, is just 1 plus 3% to the fourth power minus 1, and that's 12.55%. Again, because the compounding is more frequent than annual, our effective annual rate is greater than our stated annual rate. Now let's look at compounding frequency. John plans to invest $2,500 in an account that will earn 8% a year with quarterly compounding. Hopefully by now you're thinking, oh, that's a 2% effective quarterly rate. How much will be in the account at the end of two years? Well, over two years, we've got eight quarterly periods. Our quarterly effective rate is 2%. So we take 1 plus 2 percent to the eighth power, and that's our multiplier there. And we multiply that times the initial investment amount. So we've just grown it by 2 percent eight times. And we get an ending value at the end of two years of 29.29.15. Let's look at another example. Alice would like to have 5000 saved in an account at the end of three years. If the return on the account is 9% per year with monthly compounding, so now our stated rate is 9% with monthly compounding, how much must Alice deposit today to reach her savings goal in three years? Well, just as we use one plus this interest rate to compound into the future, if we divide by that, we can work backwards. So we get a monthly effective rate here, 9% divided by 12 of 3 quarters of a percent, 0.75 percent. Three years we know has 36 months. So now we're going to take that future value of 5,000 and we're going to divide it by 1 plus that monthly effective rate to the 36th power and get the present value of 382074. So if we looked at this the other way around, let's say we took 382074 and multiplied it by 1.0075, compounded for 36 months, and that would give us the 5,000. So when we're going forward compounding interest, we talk about it as compounding to get a future value. When we have a future value and we want to go back in time to today's value, the present value, then we divide by it. So you can see that relationship here in this example.